Hi, this is Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Today we're going to be fixing this Mark I ARP Odyssey. You might see the black case and say, hey, wait a second, this is a Mark II Odyssey, not a Mark I. Mark I Odysseys were white. Well, not all of them were. So you can see right here on the back that this is a Model 2800, which is the first model. Mark II Odyssey started at model number 2810, and Mark III Odyssey started at model 2820. Inside of this, it's exactly the same as the white face Odyssey that I restored back in my video Synth Chaser 81. Broken ARPs are pretty common and by themselves don't necessarily make for interesting videos. But the reason that we're looking at this one today is because it may be a very interesting fix. You see, the customer took the synth to a local repair shop and they told him that his filter was broken and would need to be replaced. For their filters, ARPs use little sub-modules like this one, which is a 4075 filter out of a later ARP Odyssey. On earlier synths, like the ARP 2600, the Pro Soloist, and this Mark I ARP Odyssey, the sub-modules were encapsulated, so they were enclosed and covered up, so you couldn't see the components that were inside of them, and you couldn't see the back of the circuit board or access it to do any kind of troubleshooting. ARP did this to try to keep their designs a secret, and later they did it to conceal the fact that they were infringing on the Moog ladder filter patent design. The schematics for the submodules were, weren't published in service manuals, but over time they've been reverse engineered and published on the internet. Well, the customer likes the sound of his filter, so we're going to check out the synth and see if the filter is really bad, and if it is, we're actually going to try to fix it. Right now the synth is outputting sound. <laughs> Uh, but the previous tech said he bypassed the filter, so the uh, frequency, resonance, and high pass filter sliders have absolutely no effect. So let's open it up and see what exactly this, this last guy did. Okay, it looks like he soldered a jumper wire here, which uh, is the input to the VCA, this, uh, this round IC, the OTA, is the VCA chip. So he soldered a, a jumper wire here to the input to the uh, VCA and has it coming over here and connected to pin 1 of the filter, which is the input to the filter. So he is bypassing the, uh, the filter. He's just connecting the input of the filter to the input of the VCA. So let's see if we can disconnect this and uh, see what we've got to work with. So with the filter bypass removed, we're not getting any output from the synth. So it's pretty conceivable that the filter is dead. But let's check the inputs and the outputs of the filter with an oscilloscope and be sure. All right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to verify correct power to the VCF module. So the VCF sits kind of in this area on board C, and you can see the pins poking through the board. And they're long enough that we can clip the oscilloscope probe on there and check things out. So we're going to check the power first. So pin 6 should be uh, plus 15 volts, and that's correct. Pin 7 should be ground, and pin 8 should be minus 15 volts. So we're getting correct power to the VCF. So this older 4023 VCF has two pins for the control voltage input, pin 4 and pin 3. Internally they're connected. Uh, pin 4 is pass through as it is, and pin 3 runs through a resistor and is attenuated. So we're going to see the largest control voltage here on pin 3. And pin 3 is connected to the uh, modulation sliders, so like the VCF keyboard control voltage goes through here. So I'm hitting a low, low C, and I'm getting about uh, negative 2 volts. And if I hit a high C, I'm getting about negative 5 volts, which is correct. As the filter opens, the control voltage goes more negative. So uh, that looks okay. Uh, since they're connected internally, I'd imagine the one on pin 4 is fine, but we'll take a look at it anyway. So the control voltage on pin 4 is connected to the VCF slider, the frequency slider, on the top of the synth. So when I lower the frequency cutoff, it raises the control voltage, and when I open the filter up by raising the cutoff frequency, then the control voltage goes lower. So control voltage looks okay. Now let's take a look at the inputs and the outputs to the VCF. We know that the input is going to be okay because when it was jumped over to the VCA we got sound. 
the input is here on pin 1, and it's very low amplitude. Uh, but there it is, it's a sawtooth wave from oscillator 1. So here's Synth Chaser's tip of the day. If you're looking at a low amplitude signal on your scope and it's noisy like this, you can ground your probe to the closest possible location. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clip this alligator clip onto the probe and I'm going to clip it here onto pin 7 of the VCF, which is the ground, the closest accessible ground point. Now when I reconnect the probe onto pin 1, you can see it's much less noisy than it was before. All right, now let's take a look for the output of the VCF. It comes out here on pin 10 and should be about a 2 volt peak to peak waveform. And as you can see, uh, we have nothing. No, no signal is making it through the VCF. So it's really looking like this VCF is messed up. This model 4023 filter is a two-pole filter as opposed to the later ones which were four-pole. And this early filter had an extra pin right here uh, that wasn't on the later filters that lets you probe in between the two stages of the filter. So let's check this out and get one more data point. So we'll clip on there and uh, we we're stuck at about 14, 14 volts, um, which is about a diode drop below the positive supply power rail. So it, it looks like something shorted out inside the filter. At this point, a less adventurous tech would suggest to replace the filter with a modern reproduction, which is actually what happened with the customer. But the synth chaser is unfazed and says, bring it on. So let's pull this filter out and get to it. Here's the filter submodule out of the synth. Now we've got to remove this plastic housing, the epoxy bottom, and the filling to get to the circuit board that's inside. I repaired a submodule like this uh, from one of Bernie Worrell's ARPs way back in synth chaser 22, and I cut it open with a miter saw. I'm trying to cut back on the amount of fiberglass and lead that I breathe in, so I'm going to do things a little bit differently this time. Trying to be safer, I already managed to poke myself with the pins of the, the filter, so uh, I don't know, the miter saw might be safer. But anyway, what I'm doing is I'm just, uh, with a utility knife, just kind of cutting across here and cutting the edge of the plastic case open. And you can see inside there's a layer of silicone caulk that kind of uh, encapsulates all the, the circuit board and all the components inside. So it's going to be a mess to excavate it from this, but getting it open is no problem. And uh, contrary to popular belief, this is filled with silicone caulk, which is accessible, uh, as opposed to epoxy, which uh, would be inaccessible. So let's continue to pry this open. There we go. So we've got the uh, we've got the plastic housing removed, and this layer of silicone caulk just peels off, and we can see the bottom of the circuit board there underneath. Uh, this is an epoxy, so we're going to have to get something to kind of chomp away at this. So by nibbling around these pins sticking out, I was able to get a big chunk of this epoxy to, uh, to come free like this. And uh, I have a few more pins to release and then I'll be able to get the other half off. And there we go. We've uh, got the epoxy off, we've got the plastic shell off. And now the only thing we need to do is excavate all the components out of this silicone caulk that it's in. Uh, you can see it just kind of breaks apart, but it is kind of a chore to uh, get it out from between all the components. So I'm going to clean up this mess and then we'll do that. To help clean this out, I'm going to enlist the help of these dental type picks. 
but I'm gonna just see what I can get with my hands first because a lot of this stuff will just pull up in one chunk. Alright, quite some time later I've got the filter cleaned up enough that I can see the parts and poke their leads if I need to. I couldn't just work off the bottom of the board because I don't have the component layout of this circuit board. Uh, because I don't have the component layout of the board, I'm going to try to save some time troubleshooting by making an educated guess as to what our problem is. So looking at what's on the board, uh, I'm trying to think of what would be the most likely components to fail here. And uh, the most likely components to fail would be these two tantalum capacitors. But from looking at the schematic, the tantalum capacitors are just used for decoupling the power rails. And if they failed, they could fail in two different ways. Uh, they could fail as a short circuit, but we know that they didn't because we had checked the power uh, going to the filter, and the power rails looked okay. If one of the tantalum capacitors had shorted, we'd expect to see our plus 15 or minus 15 volt rail pulled closer to ground. And while it's not the way these usually fail, the tantalum capacitors technically could fail as an open circuit. And if it failed as an open circuit, it would be like they weren't there at all, and in which case there would be little to no effect on the filter. So even though we can be sure that these aren't our culprit, uh, they're very likely to short at some point in the future, so we're going to replace them for good measure after we repair the filter. Moving on to the second most likely part to fail that I can see on this filter board would be these two ICs here, and they're op amps, they're LM301 op amps, and they fail like crazy in ARPS. So when I restore ARPS, I generally like to install the capacitor and IC kits that I sell on my website, synthchaser.com, which contain replacements for all the tantalum electrolytic capacitors and the uh, IC chips like these op amps. Uh, just because the originals fail so often. So with an op amp, there's many possible modes of failure, um, but having an output or an input stuck, especially when it's stuck close to one of the power rail voltages, is a pretty common mode of failure. So we're going to take a, an educated guess that one of these two op amps have failed, so we're going to take them out and check them. All right, so here are the two op amps removed from the filter board, and we're going to test them out in my handy op amp tester. A bunch of you have sent me messages and left comments asking for me to make these available, and I, I do plan to make a run of these next time I get some circuit boards manufactured. But uh, the way that this works is we power it with a 9-volt battery, and a good op amp flashes these LEDs and I've got a dual op amp in here now and it's flashing these two LEDs. So if I pop the single op amp in into the single op amp spot we should have this single op amp LED flashing. So we put the first one in and it basically it stops everything from flashing. So uh, it is shorted to one of the supply rails. So this op amp tests bad. So I've taken that out, and now we'll test the other op amp. And so we'll plug this in. And the second op amp tests fine. It's flashing the LED. So we, we found a bad op amp here. Okay, so we found and replaced a bad op amp here in the filter. And since I had both of them out already, I went ahead and I replaced the other one that tested good. The op amp is 45 years old, and like I said, they're very failure prone parts, so why on earth would we put a 40 plus year old op amp back in to the filter when we already have it out? Uh, additionally, I've replaced the failure prone tantalum capacitors with some aluminum electrolytic capacitors that uh, if they ever dry out and fail, they won't fail in a short circuit and, uh, and cause things to break. So since we replaced this bad op amp, does it mean that the filter is fixed now? Well, not necessarily. But the obvious problem is it would be a huge pain in the butt to put this back into the synthesizer to try to test and troubleshoot it in there. So we're actually going to test the filter on its own outside the synthesizer with the help of a little test rig that I've set up. 
A word of caution, these ARP submodules have very fine traces and they're only on one side of the circuit board. So it's very easy to destroy traces and lift pads when soldering and desoldering these. So unless you're really confident of your abilities with soldering and desoldering, it's better not to work on these. All right, this is the test setup. I've got a couple of lab bench power supplies here to serve as my power rails. This will be plus 15 volts. This will be minus 15 volts. And I've got a breadboard here with some resistors, capacitors, and uh, trimmer pots to control the VCF frequency and resonance and provide all the inputs that are required to run the VCF module. Then I've got this thing here to serve as an oscillator as input to the filter. This thing is called a function generator. That's a really old function generator. I got it broken on the cheap a long time ago and got it running. But it's not a tool that I use that often, so I don't need anything fancy. What I can do with this is I can dial up a frequency and I can select a waveform um, to get myself an oscillator. If I wanted to, I could even sweep frequencies with this. Let me show you how this works on an oscilloscope. So to get a oscillator that's rich in harmonics, I'll hit the square wave button here and I'll turn it on and I pick the range that I want it to, to work in. So I'm going to pick about 100 hertz. So there I have a, uh, a nice square wave oscillator and I can adjust the frequency. So I'm up to like 70 hertz, 100 hertz. I can change the waveform, so I have a triangle, I have a sine wave, but again, since we're testing a filter, a square wave would be the, uh, the best thing to use. And there's other features here. I can adjust the amplitude, the symmetry, uh, I can attenuate the sing signal, and, and so on. But this will be good for, for testing the filter. So I've got the patient hooked up to the test rig, and I can see now that there is output coming from the filter. So I, um, this isn't the filter that I normally have my test rig set up from, so I don't have all the full controls. But you can see as I adjust the frequency of the uh, function generator, the, the frequency or the waveform on the oscilloscope changes. So this does show signs of life, and I think we can put it back inside the synthesizer and see if it's working. Here's a working 4075 filter connected to the test rig. So I've got a square wave coming in, and you can see as I lower the frequency, less of it gets filtered. So it's looking more like the square wave input. And as I raise the frequency, I'll go up a notch here. As I raise the frequency of the input signal, more and more gets filtered and it looks more like a sine wave so higher frequency lower frequency because the 4023 filter is different from the later filters with like the 4035 and the 4075 which I designed my test rig to work with what we were seeing on the oscilloscope back there was the filter self oscillating so I've got the filter back inside the Odyssey now, and as you can see, it's working great. So I'm going to calibrate it now, and then it should be good to go. So this filter was sealed up 45 years ago with the intent that nobody would ever see it again, let alone service it. And today we fixed it and brought this Odyssey back to life. If you've got a synthesizer that seems hopelessly dead, drop me a line on my website or on Facebook. I enjoy repairing the impossible, and I also buy broken gear. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.